I don't know where to begin. I'll start by saying that I think pollution is a hundred times worse a problem than carbon dioxide. I mean, we, we, we're confronted with 101 forms of malignant and pernicious forms of pollution destroying the planet. And now we've demonized carbon dioxide. There isn't a single scrap of evidence to indicate that carbon dioxide is causing global warming. Right oh, on not. the internet. Not a single scrap of evidence. All they've got, all they've got is this correlation between ice cores from thousands and thousands of years ago. And if you go on the internet, you will find nothing that proves. Now, most of the people in this room, I would be surprised. I've, I've, I've asked 70 people in the last nine months, what percentage of our air here is carbon dioxide? Only two out of those 70 got the right answer. One was a, a high pressure welder, and the other was a farmer. All, half of the people I've asked it had university degrees. Most of them guessed between 10 and 50 percent. Well, what's the reality? 1 25th of 1 percent. I'll repeat that, 1 25th of 1 percent. Then you get methane, which you just had on there, 1.8 parts per million. Then you get nitrous oxide, one part per three million. Now anybody who supposes that these tiny amounts of gas can have any effect whatsoever on our climate or on our weather, I, I, I just find it incomprehensible. Now, uh, so what's your question? I'll just, well, what's, question? what's my question? My question is, why are we spending so much time on this foolishness about carbon tax when we're confronted with, with, with pollution. Now there's just one more thing that you get on the internet and you won't find any information about this one item. I've been trading the markets in, in Chicago, grain markets in Chicago for the last 36 years. And the USDA has just released its report, the world has never had so much wheat in, in, in its stocks uh, ever in all of history. And, car and, and beans and corn is not much further behind. So how can we possibly have all these, all these um, uh, uh, droughts and floods and hurricanes have had no effect on crop production? Crop production keeps rising and rising. And the only way you can have increased crop production is if the weather cooperates. I don't have time to go into this intergovernmental panel on climate change and how they fudge their data and whatnot. I mean, eight tenths of one degree. Who knows what, I mean, what does that cost? Um, okay, anyway. Maybe, maybe John could address this, the, this comment a little bit. So is, can I ask a question? I, I was going to ask you, Joe, because we started with this question, is climate change real? And I was like, really? We're still gonna spend time in answering that question? But this is a perfect illustration that, you know, we still are debating, not, not we, but it's amazing that scientific evidence is right there and consensus is so strong, and we still are talking whether climate change is real or not. So yeah, go ahead and ask, answer your question. Okay. So what? What do you consider to be pollution? You said pollution is worse than carbon dioxide. Well, sulfur dioxide is one of the worst. I mean, the oceans are filled with plastics. We can't eat the fish. We can't swim in the water anymore. Uh, we've got carbon um, uh, agricultural chemicals flowing into the oceans. Uh, I mean, there's a, I don't know, every food you eat has got 10 unpronounceable chemicals in it. So carbon dioxide, uh, it, 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 the science is clear, um, and I, I, you have maybe read the reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is, read it all. Which is um, not just one scientist, it's you know, tens of thousands of scientists, and they've all independently looked at this problem and come to the same conclusion, that carbon in the atmosphere, yes, it's a very small component of the atmosphere, but small but mighty, right? It can have a huge effect on the, uh, the capacity of the atmosphere to retain heat. 
Yes. By so, the way, that's one thing I forgot to mention, that this 90, so-called 97% is a complete and total fiction. No, it's no. not. Okay. It absolutely is. So just go on the internet, and you can find all well, kinds of... Depends on the source and what you're getting. If you're getting your information from the rebel media, you can hear the it's So we can have the second question here, and then the third one over there. Actually, um, I'm actually from Alberta. I actually moved back home just, well, Alberta's a mess right now, it's depending on who you talk to. You're a writer fan, are you a writer fan? Are you a writer yeah, writer? actually it's kind of funny, when you live in Calgary, you actually see more writer stuff being sold than Stampede stuff, okay. it's, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> you go to McMahon Stadium, you'll see more green stuff than red, it's kind of weird. Anyways, the problem is, is um, yeah. one, I actually seen the effects of climate change. I've actually seen the effects myself just in the last five years. I mean, the, the ski season in Banff and the Kiska, gone. The last two years, um, Fort Mac, if you look at just, just natural climate disasters in the last five years, about $15 billion in damage. If you include Slave Lake of 2011, the Bow River, Calgary and High River getting flooded out 2013, and Fort Mac of last year. Um, question. The question that I'm saying is, is I'm not sure if, if carbon pricing would be the most effective way. And I'll say that for three reasons. One, because Canada's, um, Canada's land mass is way too big. Two, our, our population is too small. If you look at, at, at locations where a climate or a carbon price has really been effective or met its mandate, it's really been done in densely population locations. Places like Alberta and Saskatchewan, it will have next to no effect other than causing more costing more money. Um, uh, but uh, I'm kind of losing my train of thought in here. But that was one of the things I want to talk about was, is I think in a more specific way, I think legislation would have a better effect than, than a climate. And one of the biggest things that you can do is start phasing out coal and for other renewable technologies. And I don't know why that isn't actually taking a better precedent than a climate or a carbon pricing. Because in, like in Alberta, for example, taxation in Alberta is kind of like how Saskatchewan sees privatization. It's just evil. So and, and you, sound sure. Yeah, so uh, just uh, on that. So if we look at, you, you can do that, and you can put the coal phase out in place, which the, the Alberta government is now doing, and the federal government is And they're fighting it tooth and nail. And part of it is, a lot of it is, is where the people get their, their, their information from. I, I mentioned it earlier. The, yeah, yeah. So the see the coal phase. So we can actually look at that. And I mentioned before, you can look at the cost of an action in terms of what does it imply for a carbon price. Uh, so the modeling I've done looking nationally, if we if we look at a path where we don't have a price of carbon, a path where we do, we would see coal plants get phased out when you hit eighty dollars a ton. Alberta coal plants are gone. So that that action, you can just you can do it. You can do it as regulation. And then we just have to know we can calculate that as having an implied carbon price of $80 a ton. So that's fine. And one thing we can think about is that carbon pricing does work well when you have complementary policies alongside it. So some sectors, like buildings, they're, they're, they take a long time to be uh, refreshed. You're not going to just tear down a house every five years. Uh, so building standards, uh, building codes are useful in that sector because they're not very price elastic. Uh, so the, the Longer a uh, capital's length of life, the the less likely carbon price is necessarily the right solution. But it's good, important to have it there to clean up kind of the rest of it, to ensure that the, that the right things are in place. So you don't just replace coal with uh, no. burning something else that's even dirtier. You know? But I mean, in, in regards to a carbon price, I mean, the only two cities that are actually going to to do something about it or it's going to have that effect would, in Alberta would be Calgary and Edmonton. Everywhere else, if you live in the oil patch or you live in a smaller center, you're not you're not going to have that kind of effect. But in in regards to to going after industry, well, industry isn't going to take this kind of stuff fighting back. They're going to pass that cost on to their customers. And and for example, um, Alberta, for example, I own property in Cold Lake, and I'm paying a power bill for power that isn't activated on my property because companies aren't going to take money losing down. They're either going to charge an, uh, a nonsense fee, which you're going to be legally bound to pay, or B, they're just going to 
they're going to pass that cost on. And maybe we can move on to the next question because we only have half an sir, hour. And sorry. Lots of people. Uh, yeah. Like, is there any other uh, regulatory approach other than carbon tax? Which I don't like the conclusion of Jim uh, because basically it says it's unfair. If you rich, you can afford to drive, and if you're poor, there's only so much you can constrain. You have to go to university, you're going to drive the same, you can't constrain more. Same thing for power, you cannot heat your house less. So you, the, the lower class strata population is going to be more affected and actually just pass on the cost of everything. Well, first of all, yeah, to address your point, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this, this doesn't necessarily hit everybody equally, okay? And the capacity to absorb the consequence is different for different groups of people. You're absolutely right about that. Now, the problem is, doing anything to reduce carbon emissions or emissions of greenhouse gases is going to inflict costs on people, whether it's regulatory or taxes. A regulatory approach, first of all, requires that you have an enforcement mechanism that you have to pay for through your taxes. And secondly, will make activities more expensive to do. So people talk about, for example, phasing out coal. Well, that's one thing to phase out coal. John, what do we get from, uh, how much electricity do we get from coal now, 40%? 40%. That 40% of the electricity that we're using right now is going to get more expensive to provide for everybody no matter what your income is. Now, the consequence of paying more for a lifestyle does affect, I'm going to say this, it affects higher income people and lower income people. I appreciate that higher income people may be able to absorb that more readily. Don't get me wrong. The point is, this is going to become, it's going to become more expensive to maintain whatever lifestyle we have now at whatever level it is now, and not everybody's going to be in a position to take that equally as well. You're absolutely right. But it doesn't matter your approach. The fact is, if you want people to emit less, you've got to make it more difficult for them to do so. And, and just to add, the, the point I made earlier, Alberta, BC, they, they return some of that revenue to lower income households in the form of rebates. So if you're in Alberta, yeah. you yeah. make less than $90,000, the rebate you get offsets the extra cost that you have to pay. So what happens comes the next election? Sorry, sorry. Let's give a chance to everybody to ask questions. We don't want the same person asking questions all over. Okay, you want to up? So, Premier Wall is opposed to carbon tax because he, he says it destroys jobs. Um, when I get my receipt at the gas station, there's a provincial sales tax on that motor fuel. When I get my natural gas bill, there's a provincial tax on that. If he were consistent, wouldn't he then eliminate the taxes on that and 40% of the tax on the electricity and so on? Because those taxes are obviously destroying jobs. Somehow it's got this, this up, either upside down, inside out, or, or dead wrong. Well, I, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about the fact that the intent, of course, in, you can't just look at the application of a tax. Taxes cost people money. It's what you do with the revenue that you generate from that tax can have an equally offsetting effect, even, even a positive impact on the economy as a whole. So looking at just one side of the question, does a tax have negative economic consequences? Pretty much every economist is going to tell you, yes, yes it does. The question then becomes, and what do you do with the revenue that you generate from that? Because that has offsetting consequences. So I think you can't look at one side of the question. Now, I don't want to get into the politics of the thing. But the fact of the matter is it's very difficult to talk about carbon pricing or emissions reduction in any form in Saskatchewan because a lot of people don't want to do it. But there already are carbon taxes. Not specifically on carbon. There are taxes on things that would also be taxed in carbon. But if you're going to put a tax on carbon, then you're going to 
put an additional tax on motor fuel and natural gas purchases and so on. Yeah. So it looks like the it's, same thing. The it tax walks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck. The tax, as proposed by the federal government at this point in time, when it's fully implemented, would be slightly less than the current tax rate for gasoline in Saskatchewan, federally or provincially. like BC that have said every dollar goes back in the form of tax cuts or rebates. Alberta has said two-thirds of the revenue goes back as rebates and one-third is going to be used for green energy projects like expanding wind energy in Alberta. Like they're trying to build 4,400 4, megawatts more of wind. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure it necessarily, it doesn't affect the economic efficiency of it. It's still, the carbon price is going to be as efficient if you're whatever you do with the money, but the, the big question I think we need to ask in Saskatchewan is what do you do with the money? So, you, like you said, you could, uh, what Jim's paper said, you could eliminate personal income tax when you get to $50 a ton if nobody has responded and we're still paying that $2.5 billion. Or you could eliminate PST. Uh, so, you, we have to pick, and as economists would tell you, you want to tax the things you don't like and don't tax the things you like. So, we like people working, we, we don't want to tax their incomes, we want to encourage them to work. Uh, why not reduce the income tax, reduce corporate income tax in, in place of the revenue you get from uh, carbon taxes? Okay. Any questions? Any questions? So, my question according to the EPA report, uh, uh, it is a global warming is 1.4 to 5.8 degrees centigrade decrease on 2100 year. So, we have to reduce the human made carbon dioxide release is 74 percent of human made because including uh, industrial uh, transportation coal fire this is a major major part but human the waste is even the waste also is coming one percent why we not take this carbon capture because of uh, the research in carbon capture in cement plant we make the money from the carbon capture, we sell the carbon dioxide. The right now is $25 per ton. The future is going to be $45 per ton. So we, from this industry, we make money, even money in the clean energy. We can capture the carbon dioxide. We make the safety for the country because we make the clean energy, sorry, clean environmental because how they capture the industrial area, most of the industrial area, carbon, coal fire like this. So why not make more carbon capturing centers can capture the carbon, make the clean energy for clean environment, make money for the industry, who is this making the carbon industry, carbon capture. So sound and electric gas, why not carbon yeah. um, capture? Um, and, uh, 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 to tell you the pollutant have to pay money. Who's the pollutant? People, or industry person, or owners, or government. Who's the person have to pay? Well, everyone is a polluter. Uh, as far as we, we use some sort of energy, uh, that is for a source of CO2 emission. We are all polluters. Uh, firms, industries, individuals, every day. Um, to come back to the carbon capture project, uh, the estimates for carbon capture that he was mentioning accounts for the, the revenue from the the revenue from the enhanced oil recovery um, sales. So even after we account for the captured car carbon dioxide that we sell for revenue, the implied uh, agreement cost is about sixty dollars a ton. That is huge compared to the alternative um, policies. So, carbon capture is expensive at the existing technology. Of course, future estimates show that the cost can come down over time 
So any current research and any demonstration projects in CC has can be supported, uh, given that these efforts might imply there is a learning effect which would reduce the cost in the future. But as of now, it's not competitive with other alternatives. Uh, the cost estimate we're talking about accounts for the gain we are talking about as well. Okay. There was a question there, and then yeah, there. Okay. Yes, you. Uh, this one is the number of the industry groups here. I just want to look at it from a more economics standpoint. Good. Uh, if you take the example from Australia, for example, uh, Australia, Australia's national carbon tax came into effect July 1st, 2012, and was repealed two years later on July 17th, 2014. So Australians tried a carbon tax and it didn't work. So they repealed it. And Canadians, I think, Canadians, you know, can we take a look at that to see how it would take a close look at that experience, see how it affects us. Um, Australia produces roughly 1.5% of the world greenhouse gases. Canada produces approximately between 1.65% to 1.72% of greenhouse gases. So it's pretty, you know, you say rough similarity there. Uh, many Australians during the time of the carbon tax faced high energy bills and job losses as a result of the carbon tax. Uh, the government was forced to create, you know, heaps of bureaucracy, rebates, you know, like the gentleman there mentioned, uh, free carbon credits, and red tape just to deal with the fallout from the tax. And worst of all, it uh, did virtually, uh, according to some many experts, it virtually did nothing to impact global climate change. And you know, given that many are expected to follow this path, my question is, you know, how much emissions does it, does the carbon tax in Canada seek? To, would you predict seek to you know take care of? And would you say that it's all worth it? Thank you. So I, I get uh, two things uh, in response. Uh, when people talk about carbon pricing, they often say it's great policy, bad politics. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, tax has become a four-letter word uh, in, in our society today. People don't like the thought of being taxed. So I mean, it would be nice to see, and we haven't seen this uh, in too many places, but maybe we're starting to see it in Ontario and Canada, where people across the political spectrum start to see the value in, in taking action on climate change and using an efficient policy like carbon pricing. So right now, the debate in Ontario is the Liberal government has a cap and trade system. They like the progressive conservatives who are trying to beat them in the election next year or whatever that's coming up. They want a revenue neutral carbon tax. <coughs> so I'm glad that they have got to that point in the discussion. I guess Australia wasn't at that point. Obviously, the fact that they repealed it didn't replace it with anything. Uh, but in terms of what we need to do to to get our reduction. So to meet our 2030 target, people say you need 100 to $150 per ton uh, of a carbon price in Canada. If you do, some, some would say, because it's politically unpopular, just do $50 a ton carbon price and then do a whole bunch of other things. But the thing is you have to do a bunch of other things. You have to put a, an intensity standard on vehicles. Uh, so you, you'd have to say to a car manufacturer, you can sell, uh, all the, all the, well, you can sell 10% of your vehicles are these, these gas guzzlers, uh, and the rest have to be low emissions, and 10% have to be electric. So you can be that prescriptive and tell them what they have to do, and you can get emission reductions that way. But you have to do that sort of sector by sector by sector to get the reductions. So what we're trying to do is get to that 2030 target. Is it worth it? I mean, uh, that's, that's that question I asked. Like, is climate change an urgent issue? If you say yes, then yeah, we gotta get there, and we gotta get there, you know, the thing about a carbon price is you do it, escalate it over time. So it's that, it's it's a gentle entry into the world of emission reductions. Like what's two cents a liter on gasoline? Gasoline prices vary 10 cents a liter day to day. Uh, but it's getting the point across that this is gonna cost money. And so as we make decisions in the future, we have to think about our pollution. There was a question over there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess I, I was just gonna ask, just kind of based on what you just said, but are other jurisdictions that are offering that, that do have a carbon tax offering some kind of incentive to say buy an electric or a hybrid vehicle or retrofit their house with solar panels or or are they or is it, or is the onus going to be on the manufacturers like you said the car companies to come up with the technology to make more efficient cars just by law or by There are 
many jurisdictions that are offering incentives for lower emission vehicles, for example, and, uh, and uh, supporting uh, alternate energy sources as well in the development. And some of those are being funded through carbon taxes, but generally, uh, I mean, there's a lot more of this activity across European jurisdictions, for example. And um, I think the carbon tax in Sweden is like $120 a ton. And uh, that's going uh, partly to fund general, generally not going into general revenue, it's going to fund specific projects. So one here and then one over there, you've been holding your hands for a long time. Kate, okay. Yeah, you yeah. know. Interested to add would be in a, in a disadvantageous position uh, if they did. So, in the absence of carbon tax, even if you are um, kind of pro environmental, you don't want to do it because you can't compete in the business, right? Um, so, the, uh, that would answer the first question. This, the second one is um, uh, the fact that we have crown corporations here. Um, maybe it's easier for the government to. Uh, introduce, for example, standards such as the carbon capture. Um, if it is a private sector, I wonder if we will have a carbon capture because it's not cost effective at the stands now. Yeah, yeah just, yeah, just uh, one thought to add is I, I know sometimes we've heard that carbon pricing will decap the economy. I think of the crap corporations as sort of the knee pads. Uh, they're going to stop that impact because you, you get the money and then you can decide to take action to reduce emissions. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I have just uh, my observation or my observation would be like if global warming is actually real and global, meaning therefore that what happens here it also affects other continents, and what happens in other continents also affects here. Now putting carbon tax on the people over here. Is there anything that the government or whatever maybe global United Nations is doing to also capture what also happens in other continents that is actually affecting um, this part of the world? Because what happens here, I also believe that it happens anywhere. Like the presenter just said, there are about 45, 44 facilities. There is a meeting here in Saskatchewan and um, 24 companies. You can get those statistics very easily here. But what about a continent like Africa, where you may not even have, almost everywhere is being polluted. And this pollution is also going into the atmosphere and also capturing over the whole world. So what would be the government or whatever global nation I understand? Maybe um, uh, Jim Marshall will be able to add, because he has uh, maybe one of the things that it is to do on that area, so that it will not be as if they are putting more pressure on the people this on this part of the world and other people are just freely polluting the environment. I could start off with something clear that uh, this is a you're right. This, this is a global problem, right? Um, the West or the advanced the, the uh, economically advanced countries in the world have a bigger role to play. We need to step up to the plate. And, uh, and address our carbon, our, our energy consumption, and our carbon pollution, uh, so that the countries that can't afford this can, can uh, get on board more quickly. Um, you know, the world, one of the world's biggest polluters of, uh, of carbon right now is China, but China is making huge strides to reduce their emissions. They're, they're the number one builder of solar panels and, um, and wind farms in the world right now. So they're working that way. They know, they recognize that they're still the number one coal burning country in the world. So they're working hard to make that, to reduce that. So it's, it is a global problem. Um, it is, it's a global problem. And we all have to work together. Okay. Um, 
we we only have room for a few questions, so let's ask those mm. people who haven't had a chance to ask any questions yet. So I, I saw your hands early on. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I was surprised in these discussions that I hear carbon taxes kind of cost and not seen as an investment kind of fund. Um, you know, an investment that over time will pay off and reduce costs to everyone in the long term. So I'm, I'm curious, I guess, to understand your, from your perspective on that idea of carbon tax and revenue neutral carbon tax, um, why it wouldn't be directed back entirely into emissions reductions and why it would be spread out to try and reduce other things, knowing that there's so many opportunities to reduce emissions in, in a variety of ways from simple things like changing your light bulbs to more complicated things like capturing flare gas and building infrastructure to get that built up. Using the, the rest for uh, other technological developments, that is exactly the economic arguments. The actual the estimates show that uh, a carbon tax would be in the long term highly become highly effective if we use the funds for uh, the stuff we just mentioned. Yeah. I suppose, as far as affecting the poor more, well, um, I would think that they're the less likely to be the ones going out to invest in changing the light bulbs and stuff on their own. Would that not be something that, rather than giving them cash back, would you not give them rebates on specific things that will help lower their costs in their lives for the long term, <coughs> rather than just cash back and what, in my mind, that doesn't seem to be doing what the goal, what the target is. I mean, the, the sort of standard economics answer is, well, let people maximize their utility by picking whatever they want to do with their money, and everyone will be happier. Uh, but yeah, from an emissions reduction perspective, you might get more results doubling down in that way. Uh, maybe it's a blend of the two then. Like Alberta has taken that blended approach two thirds rebates, one third programs, including energy conservation programs. Can I in the black sweater? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go back to a couple of comments that both Brent and Sam made. Uh, I think Sam made a point earlier that this is a, a global issue. And Brent made the point that Macron in France has come up with an innovative way to try to deal with carbon leakage by putting a border adjustment tax on. There was another very interesting initiative at the Bonn Climate Conference which didn't come up, which was a loss and damage tax, which was proposed to support the impact of climate change on developing countries who are going to be the ones that get the brunt of the impacts, at least in the short term. And so the concept there is to tax the consumers who are responsible for the emissions in largely in the developed countries transfer the revenues from that to the developing countries. Most of our discussion in Canada is very syllogistic. We focus on putting money back into the consumer's pockets in our jurisdictions so they're no worse off. How do we deal with these much larger global issues using carbon pricing in a productive way? I, I realize it's a very provocative question, but it is really going to be a key issue that comes up internationally in successive conferences. Maybe I'll direct it to Brent initially and then Sam and others uh, beyond that. Yeah, well, I think it speaks to the point you made about, you know, what about what's going on in Africa? And as you say, the biggest impacts of climate change are going to be felt in Africa. They're also the ones who've contributed least, cumulatively and presently, to the emissions. So I think that I can see the argument there, and that the politics will be the tricky part. So right now, Ontario has linked in with California, their cap and trade market, and part of the reason why the progressive conservatives are campaigning on a carbon, re revenue neutral carbon tax in Ontario is because they say they don't like the money going out of the province. So there is still that, uh, there's sort of these two, two levels, I guess, of barrier. First, people don't necessarily want a carbon price. If they have a carbon price, they want all that money to stay in their jurisdiction. Um, so, but maybe we could get there in the long term. I don't know if you have thoughts. We, we, we discussed that in the room before we came, and I deliberately avoided that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, lady in the, uh, in the blue, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, there was the mention of Australia where they gave it a two year try. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And I just can't imagine that in two years you could really tell what's happening. 
So I'm wondering if there are other countries where they have had carbon tax or other means in policies uh, where we're seeing a real effect in those countries, a positive effect in environmental terms and social terms as well. Yeah, we, we did look a little bit at some of this, and there are, it's, um, it, it's been mentioned that the British Columbia's tax has had a consequence on emissions in British Columbia. And we did look at a few other jurisdictions. Uh, the Swedish tax that I mentioned, which is at a pretty high rate, has reduced emissions there by 20 to 30%.